大家晚上好，欢迎大家来到国际培训大咖五十谈，我是郭立民。上一周我们非常荣幸的请到了 Dr. Gregory Sales， Greg Sales 啊，是塞尔斯博士。我们围绕着很多基础的问题，包括呃教学系统设计的模型、电子化学习等等啊，很多方面的问题呢，与他向他进行了请请教，与他进行了探讨。特别是塞尔斯教授呢。在退休之前，是担任过曾经担任过明尼苏达大学教学设计与技术系的系主任很久的时间。另外呢，他也是一位非常成功的企业家，他自己开设的电子化学习的咨询公司非常的成功。他曾经为四十五个国家的很多的呃政府及呃及这个。企业设计过在线的课程，同时呢，他为世界五百强、世界一百强的公司设计开发过无数的课程，非常的成功。呃，这也是一个非常优秀的例子，就是说跟，跟呃依靠我们的专业知识啊，能够能够取得商业上成功的一个非常优秀的这个范例。那么在上次访谈当中呢，我们就很多的这个问题呢，向他进行了请教啊。那么同时呢，在这里说一下呢，呃，塞尔斯教授呢，也是我的老朋友。我和他相识大概有二十三年、二十四年时间时间了，将近四分之一个世纪了。那么塞尔斯教授呢，学识非常丰富，工作经验啊、经历也非常的丰富。呃，在我们上次的这个这个访访谈当中呢，我们还请他介绍了呃电子化课程或者说网络学习的课程。如何真正的去设计与开发？特别是现在网络课程非常非常的流行，那么如何去真正的设计开发一门真正的合格的啊符合标准的电子化学习的课程，而不只是信息呢？因此呢，我们也在呃也围绕着微学习、微课等等啊呃方面的一些个基础性问题呢，向他进行了验证和请教。同时呢，我想跟大家说一下呢。呃，塞尔斯教授的另外一本书啊的一本书呢，叫《培训方式的革命：电子化学习指南》。我是在二零零三年还还在回国来之前的时候呢，就把它翻译成了中文，由北京的中信出版社出版。呃，这本书到今天啊，这本书不是很厚啊，挺薄，一本小册子。但是呢，对于今天啊，我们的电子化在学习在线课程的如何设计与开发，团队由哪些人组成，它的整个的生命循环、设计开发的流程，以及团队各个成员的角色与这个与这个工作的标准都是什么样子的？等等等等，都进行了非常详细的阐述，对我们今天特别具有啊，特别具有这个实用的意义。那么，在上次的这个访访谈当中呢，我们也就呃如何啊，如何把这个微学习变成真正的知识啊，变成真正的课程。啊，而不是一个微信息软件包这方面的进行了探讨，也非常的有意思。所以呢，呃，如果大家没有看的话呢，希望大家能够进行回看。啊，我们再次感谢啊，塞尔斯 Greg Sales 啊 ，Dr. Greg Sales 塞尔斯教授几十年来为整本领域做出的贡献，也非常感谢您为我们树立的成功的这个成功的这个这个企业家的这个榜样啊，从专业人士变成企业家的这样的这样的榜这样的榜样。希望我们继续保持长久的联系，并且能够未来向您从您那里学到更多。谢谢。今天晚上，本周我们又一次非常非常的荣幸啊，请到了另外一位本领域里面非常非常重量级的嘉宾，他的名字叫 Victoria Victoria Marsic 维多利亚马斯克教授。马斯克教授呢是国际著名的学习型组织权威，他是哥伦比亚大学人力资源的教授，同时呢，他在二零零六年呢被国际成人及终身教育名人堂呢，呃，这个选为了啊该名人堂的成员啊，这是一个非常至高上的这个荣誉，英文呢叫 I A C E Hall of Famer。那么马斯克教授呢？他在呃，他经过这个四十多年啊，他在这个领域里面呢，研究和实践已经有四十多年的时间了。他的研究领域呢，涉及面很广，如非正式学习 （informal learning）、行动学习 （action learning）、工作场所学习 （workplace learning）、啊，终身学习 （lifelong learning）、组织学习、学习组织、无意图学习，或者叫 incidental learning， 叫附带学习 （DLOQ）， 就是一种学习型组织的啊评分问卷标准等等等等。他。都非常
涉猎非常之广，而且呢，研究非常之深，并且呢，是在这些方面呢，成为了权威级的人物。所以，我们本周呢，将围绕着这些问题来向他请教。好，我们闲话少叙，下面我们就隆重的请出 d r Victoria Marsic。Hi, d r Marsic, how are you? Hi, George. I'm very, very good this morning, and I know it's your evening where you are. <laughs> Pleasure to yes, talk. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for accepting our invitation to be on the Training Master Series. It is my honor, really. Mm -hmm. We have we've known each other, so uh, in our interview, I'll I'll address you by your first name, if that's okay. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But mm -hmm. now, uh, I know that you're a Clim you're a H HRD professor at uh, Columbia University, but not everybody knows about you. So for your for our audience, would you please introduce yourself? Tell us where you grew up, where you went to college, where you studied, what you studied, and tell us where you live and work now. Okay. Uh, so I was born in Cleveland, Ohio. It's a kind of industrialized and in Actually, quite a number of different uh, people from different cultures and different parts of the world live in Cleveland. So I was always, always interested, I, maybe because of Cleveland or maybe because my father was very curious in people from all over the world. So uh, I, however, spent the first 20 some years of my life in Cleveland. I, I went to school there, local schools uh, for elementary, high school, and a local college, Notre Dame College, which was an all women's college. Um, and my, my majors were in, uh, in social studies and in English literature um, and grammar and all those kinds of things, et cetera. Um, but I, I always had a, a great interest in um, different cultures. And um, my, uh, so when I had an opportunity to uh, go to India as part of my graduate studies, I, I really took that opportunity up and I went to uh, Syracuse University has a school mm -hmm. of international public administration, which is where I where I studied, um, and that program had a um, an opportunity to spend ten months in, in India or Pakistan, mm -hmm. and um, I went to India, and actually my my ten months ended up spending extending into about fifteen months because I. When everybody else went back, I had an opportunity to stay on for a while. So I did stay for about another five, six months. I, I worked in the area of health and family planning, uh, which at that time was a very, very interesting um, area. We did training. So that's where my first exposure to training and development and to educational studies. And I guess you would call it human resource development. We didn't call it that at that time uh, came. And uh, so, Anyway, it was a very, very interesting uh, opportunity. I came back, finished my studies at Syracuse University, and um, I took a job with a group called World Education, which is a small nonprofit organization uh, that worked with seed money, small amounts of money, and mostly in the not-for-profit sector, some, some government projects. And uh, I, I was working in the New York office for a year, and then I went out and helped a couple of our um, our partners to do some, uh, assisted them in doing some workshops and some training. Uh, there were uh, people coming in to help them with that. You may know uh, Len Nadler's name because of our field. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he was one of the consultants that came out. And um, in fact, I, I actually learned how to do training in, in a more, uh, I don't know, sophisticated way by, wa by watching Len Nadler do training and by observing what he was doing. And taking careful notes. And so when it came time for me to do training, I said, well, what would Len Nadler do? And so I would do that kind of thing. So uh, so I had an opportunity to meet with, work with him, with Jack Mesro in that capacity and with a number of very interesting people in the field. Um, these were organizations um, that mostly worked in villages uh, with uh, non-formal education, informal education. It's, it's where I first came across the whole idea of informal learning as a area of focus. Uh, at that time, distinctions were being made by Phil Coombs of, between informal learning, non-formal learning, and formal learning. And um, there was a very, very, very lot of, lot of activity in that area. So I did that and came back. And um, after that, I, um, I did some uh, work with world education in New York. So I, I continued to work on those studies and areas, et cetera. 
And eventually I found my way back to graduate school again. So I, I had met uh, Jack Mesereau, uh overseas in his work. Um, and he was a consultant to the group I was working with, World Education. So he advised me on a couple of possible universities to study in, including Columbia. But I decided to go to the University of California, Berkeley. So um, that was a wonderful experience. Um, they always say that you never know how wonderful your graduate opportunities are if you can. I could study full time, which seems like such a luxury these days, and uh, just had a wonderful time. I worked with uh, grounded theory, which was at that time um, a research method that rather than starting from um, hypothesis generation from the top down, looked at how we can construct stories of people and understand what's going on from the bottom up and to construct it in a fairly systematic and rigorous way. And um, so that was really quite a, a wonderful opportunity. I studied with the two people who founded it, Anselm Strauss and Barney Glazer. And um, mm -hmm. actually uh, it was uh, in order to do a field study project at the time, um, you might be interested in this. Uh, there was a, uh, in Chinatown, there was a Chinese mental health center there. And, uh, you know, I was sort of going through culture shock at Berkeley because I'd come back from Southeast Asia and mm -hmm. I, uh, I didn't really, um, you know, I, it was a little odd living in the United States again. So I went and interviewed with the gentleman who ran that center and everybody told me, don't even bother. They won't let you be there. You know, you're a white person. <laughs> you can't possibly be a, in a Chinese mental health center. So I, I, I went anyway and I talked with him and he said, well, why do you want to, why do you want to do this here? And I said, cause I'm going through culture shock <laughs> and, the, and the gentleman must've taken pity on me, you know? So he, he let me do my field studies there. Um, it was a wonderful experience. And, uh, you know, so I got hooked on a, a number of these kinds of, of things. And, uh, actually my field study had been on training of staff because I noticed that the uh, although informal learning is very good, and I know we're going to talk about it, it has a, a downside as well, because uh, it often is based kind of on socialization patterns. And when we're socialized into things, we're also not uh, helped to question them. Mm -hmm. And so there's always a plus side to socialization, and there's always a negative side to socialization. And it, ha it happened that the negative side of socialization in that particular example was causing friction among the staff. And um, it was a very interesting opportunity to kind of see that and with my naive kind of way, help put that on the table for discussion among the staff. When the staff first saw the report that I'd written the research report, um, that's another story in itself, how that happened. But um, some of them wouldn't talk with me because I was putting things on the table that were hard for them to you know, pay attention to. Not, not too similar to what we're going through in this country right now with you know, many mm -hmm. people feeling misunderstood on different sides and points of view, uh, you know, feeling their identities in many ways were being ignored and disrespected. So, so anyway, I had a wonderful opportunity there. And I also, while I was doing my studies, uh, Jack Mesro was doing his uh, research on women's reentry programs. Uh, and so, uh, you may know of that work. It's, it's all about transformative learning. And he had discovered through his process of um, really doing kind of ethnographic field work at community colleges, uh, sitting and observing the classes and the people who were in these programs, talking with people, uh, et cetera. He was doing a grounded theory study of what, what was really going on in these programs. And through that effort, he discovered uh, this idea of transformative learning, which I had then um, picked up on uh, and um, actually joined with um, the idea that uh, Karen and also works with around Chris Argers's work and Don Shun's work around action science, uh, which action science and transformative learning have some things in common. So that, uh, you know, that, that really kind of set me up, I think, for um, where, what I was interested in. Um, I ultimately uh, did my dissertation. I was going to study those reentry programs that I was working on, but instead I went back uh, to my earlier work with um, Southeast Asia and I did a, um, a field study of 
three different training programs or training approaches that work with village level educational field workers. So I worked with one in Nepal, which was a kind of live in program where uh, people really had to change how they thought and um, experienced working with villagers in order to understand them and to really help them grow and change in the health area. Uh, the second, and that was in Nepal. And the second one was in Taiwan. And that one was a run by um, public health area. And they were looking at people, as you would know, I mean, Taiwan is a much more urbanized area than Nepal. <laughs> so a lot of educational field workers whose, whose field was the cities uh, but I was looking at uh, how they really incorporated active training methods in their approach to helping people learn how to talk with people about changing um, deep habits in their lives uh, around health. Um, and uh, the third was in the Philippines. And it, that was run by the Philippine Rural Reconstruction Movement. And so uh, they also worked with, they actually had an approach that was highly participatory and interactive, used a lot of um, uh, pictures and you know, in, in the, it, it was pre-internet, so they couldn't use internet uh, graphics or any, any that kind of stuff, but they kind of created uh, very innovative materials to help people uh, depict their lives and try to understand how life might change, et cetera. So, uh, so that was my dissertation. It took me a lot longer. Somebody should have told me you're doing three dissertations with three case studies like that. <laughs> but anyway, <Right. laughs> um, so that's you. It's a long story, but that's when that's where I studied and that's what I did. And uh, I uh, found my way eventually uh, to New York City, where I um, I started to work with UNICEF. While I was collecting data for my dissertation, I lived and worked in Bangladesh. So um, I was working with uh, two women's organizations there and uh, they were uh, really trying to change their curricula or develop their curricula, their training curricula for women uh, mm -hmm. to help them um, you know, get into a real mode of how you can be useful in the world. You know, women's roles are changing at that time, not, not a ton, but in ways that call for them to have new capabilities and to, you know, to get more skills. And they also began relying on them for women's development work in health and in other areas in the villages, which was quite uh, challenging. So I was working with two women's organizations that were doing curriculum development work around uh, training for women health workers and field level workers, um, and also in the area of um, earning a living uh, kind of thing. So, um, so I was in Bangladesh uh, for a while, and when I um, I got married there, and uh, and we moved afterwards to Costa Rica, uh, where um, my my first husband that was I'm now married to someone else, uh, but my first husband was in the State Department, and he was working in Costa Rica. So I had a year in Costa Rica after I finished my PhD, in which I. Um, pretty much studied Spanish. And, um, you know, I began to talk with people there about possibly teaching at the local university. But then an opportunity came to apply for this job with UNICEF. And so I, uh, I joined UNICEF, I worked with their staff development and training for about five years. And um, at that point, uh, UNICEF was moving in some different directions. And I had an opportunity to apply and work at Columbia University because I had been adjunct teaching at Columbia in Dr. Mesro's program. And uh, an open opening came, I applied and eventually was hired. So that's where I've been since. I've been at, uh, at Teachers College, only university I've worked at, uh, which is, I don't know, maybe unusual these days. <laughs> uh, but but it's, uh, it's where I've been all my, uh, my prof professorship life. You bet. How many years have you been uh, with uh, Teachers College? I hate to say, I think it's been close to 30. 30 <laughs> it's years? been a long time. <laughs> I don't count the years. It's a, it's a pastime that seems counterproductive to me. I try to stay in the present. 
<laughs> so uh, yeah, all the time, and uh, we I, we introduce somebody, and then this is uh, this is a professor so and so. He's uh, ninety years uh, ninety years uh, young. So <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not quite there yet, but <laughs> no, I mean I mean make a just I just want yeah. to say the term I, like yeah, uh, yeah. something like that, you know. Uh, <laughs> I learned that from President Obama, and one time I listened to his speech, and, and then he introduced somebody. He's uh, he's some you know with some veterans. So yes. I thought it's a very nice term to uh, nice to say term. that. It is a nice yeah. term. <laughs> Thank you. You mentioned uh, uh, so you, you uh, to me you have a very diverse diversified uh, uh, background. I mean, you lived here mm -hmm. and there, Southeast Asia, and mm -hmm. you did your, your dissertations in Nepal, Taiwan, and Philippines. That's really three projects. I mean, it the three dissertations. Three product, it's like three dissertations. <laughs> <laughs> three, That's very awesome. heavy, very heavy. But <laughs> I bet it was, I bet it was a very profound studies and gained a lot of valuable data and evidence and, and uh, was very good dissertation. But um, I'm I, I'm so glad that you mentioned the word uh, informal learning as your self intro because I'm going to start from there. I know that your your area of study in the human research development areas has a wide spectrum of topics like informal learning, action learning, workplace learning, lifelong learning, uh, incidental learning, uh, uh, learning organizations. You you mentioned uh, Chris Ashley's and so many areas. So. I want to cover all of them, but which is impossible. I so I try to hit, you know, you know, all those like, you know, quick and run, you know. So, yeah. but let's start with uh, um, informal learning first. Mm -hmm. So informal learning very very popular in China now and these days because in the past, you know, in the old uh, plant economy era, it was, it was it was all formal learning. Even in the first twenty years, mm -hmm. two decades of opening up since nineteen. 78, you know, and then it was still like planned, structured, formal learning. So tell us, please, what is informal learning and uh, why is it important to company training? Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, you I know you talked to Karen Watkins and Karen probably right. told you the story of how she and I got to start working on together on informal instant learning. Uh, did she tell you that story? Uh, no, not quite. Yeah. I, I know that uh, it, she, it is, she, you, you and her have been uh, working, writing together for 30 years. Yeah, we have. We have been. And, it, you know, because both she and I were, you know, relatively early in our professorial career, but uh, we had both attended a um, presentation. It was a, really a debate between Jack Mesro and Len Nadler about mm -hmm. whether or not training was adult learning. So, you know, mm -hmm. there's been a lot of interesting question that the two fields are very related and my degree is in adult education and, uh, you know, in, in that field, but I've, I've applied it, as you can see, to training and to um, particularly workplace kinds of things uh, my, my whole career. But uh, Karen and I were at that session and Karen was one of the facilitators that uh, Len, she had worked with Len Nadler. So we broke up, of course, into after each of them gave an opening statement into some groups and we had we had to debate this question of whether or not um, training uh, workplace training was adult learning or not and uh, Karen and I I happened to be in the group Karen was facilitating and we found that she would start something and I would practically finish her sentences and vice versa you know so we discovered this oh. affinity you know to one another yep. Yep. Um, so I, we were both interested uh, in informal learning and we, we, we started to talk about it and think about how we could write about it. I'm not sure how Karen, uh, she may have shared that in her story about how she got- She did, she, she did share, but not in that uh, detail, but I wanna hear your version yeah. as well. That'd be great. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, we, we decided to write this book on, uh, on learning in the workplace. I had had a contract uh, to, to do this and um, so I invited her to write uh, a chapter. And one of the things we had in common was both of us were incredibly interested in action science. And uh, Karen had um, in fact contracted with uh, Chris Argers and Donald Schoon at the University of Texas to bring them in to uh, train their faculty in using action science. And they had hoped to really make it a, a feature of their curriculum. 
Um, I had been, I'm not sure exactly where and how I started reading Chris Ardress's work, but I do recall while I was doing my doctorate, there was another student in that program who was also interested in uh, Ardress's work. And, um, and I think that probably both of our interests uh, in some ways uh, came out of that idea that was, I was thinking about Chris this morning, Chris Ardress, because he was very, very focused on um, developing a science of action. Action mm -hmm. science really means a science of action. And it really had to do with how, um, how we learn or how we block learning as we interact with one another and how that is really intricately connected, uh, not just with you or I as an individual, but with the situation that we find ourselves in, you know, the organization as a holder for learning or the group as a holder for learning and how it is that um, despite the fact that we have certain um, intentions about what we want to communicate or how we wanna be, uh, we often end up being our own worst enemies and we, we actually don't implement it in the way that we need to in order to carry that through. We stop short because of things that we believe or think that hold us back from um, being able to just do what it is we intend to do or to express what we intend to express, et cetera. And so we're, we're our own worst enemies, you know, in a sense. And so at, at the heart of that is the idea of informal and incidental learning. You can train people to in the skills of action science, but action science happens and is practiced as we interact with one another, as we talk with one another, uh, as we try to make decisions together and, and work together. And so um, action science has always been a shared value and view, worldview. And in fact, Karen invited me to join their seminars and uh, and I did that, which was a really a wonderful opportunity for me to be able to get more depth and capability in that area of action science. And uh, I did uh, teach action science at, at uh, Columbia Teachers College um, in, the, in the early days. We're not teaching it right now, but um, I, I, I created a series of workplace learning, um, uh, a workplace learning institute series, which looked at how people were learning at work uh, and you know, uh, and that included action science. And uh, when when I think of informal learning, particularly in the context of the work that you're doing and we are all doing with organizations, uh, Karen and I uh, thought about how uh, there's really an interaction between uh, training or should be and informal learning. And that uh, if you look at, we had a cone, we, we created a cone in one of our first books. Uh, and we looked at how, in fact, about 80% um, of the resources um, in, in, in human resource development are often spent on formal learning because it is something that we can see and we can manage. And organizations are all about control and management, right? So uh, we're trying to help people get to certain places and we look for how we can make that happen in better ways. And so in doing that, um, it's easier to see and touch and manage the, the more formalized si uh, side of things. And that's true also in informal learning. Um, you will see uh, articles that urge us to, let's just formalize informal learning, you know? And there's, there's something too part of that. So I wouldn't you know, say we shouldn't. Um, I think there's a continuum and the, the two pieces need to work together. So we could do better at being able to um, look at the skills, for example, that we're helping people learn in a workshop and moving them, uh, creating a, an opportunity for people to better be supported as they take those back and use them and then bring them back and look at them. And so um, the really at the heart of informal learning um, is the idea that we're learning all the time or we could be, and that every situation that we encounter offers us um, an opportunity to think about more consciously and intentionally about what's going on in that situation and whether we could think about it in different ways and um, you know whether what we're doing and how we're approaching it is really going to, to help us learn the most that we can so that we can get the best outcome from it. And that's really at the heart of action science. And it's, it's at mm -hmm. the heart of the way Karen and I conceptualized informal and incidental learning. Mm -hmm. Is uh, informal learning 
intentional? Well, this is a, a, a question that's out there. I think it had, there's an intentionality about informal learning. Um, there is. I don't, I don't think that it's a necessarily that we're aware of the intentionality. I, I don't know if you, uh, I, I recall when I first had to buy a car, you know, when I came back from India and Asia and I lived in, in the Bay Area for the first year, I just wrote, I just had a bicycle. You could live mm -hmm. in Berkeley and bicycle to the campus and you didn't need to right. have a car. Uh, but, but eventually being in a city, I, I felt I needed to have a car to really get around. And I was doing some research that required me to move to different campuses and do observations and stuff. So, uh, so I did buy a car, but when, when you're buying a car, uh, all of a sudden you become, you start looking at cars, at different cars in a different way. You know, so your intentionality at the back of your mind causes you to pay attention to certain things. And mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of things uh, we know um, from neuroscience that uh, we have selective attention, that all of us pay attention to some things and don't see other things in every situation right. that we encounter. And so I, I think that intentionality is sometimes explicit, like I set a goal and I go after a certain kind of thing, but we also have intentionalities in our life that, uh, that are in the background that we maybe don't think about all the time, but that guide us in one direction or another. Um, informal learning means that you're, you notice things. So we're, our attention is directed to things that we're looking at for one reason or another. Uh, even though that reason not, might not be completely clear to us. So I think there's a level of intentionality around informal learning. Incidental learning, which Karen and I define as a subset right. of, of informal learning. I'm just going to, to ask that. Uh, yeah. Is incidental, what's the difference between informal learning well, and incidental learning? Yeah, in, uh, we may have intentionality as we're, say we're going to a meeting. Karen and I often use this example. You know, you go to a meeting and you have intentional learning in that meeting. So my intentional meeting learning might involve what's on the agenda, but it might also involve uh, looking at how the signals that people in the in decision-making group are giving about some decision that we're trying to make that they're not necessarily aware of or trying to communicate, but they communicate just by what they say and how they say things, et cetera. So that can be informal learning. I, I go to the meeting with several agendas about what it is that I wanna learn some of which have to do with the formal side of it, some of which have to do with the informal side of it. But while I'm there, I notice some things that I, subconsciously that I never even thought to, to notice. And I find myself afterwards picking up on those things, right? Mm -hmm. So incidental learning as Karen and I have defined it is that uh, you, know, you set out to do one thing and incidentally along the way, uh, or as one of our colleagues says, en passant, uh, you you learn other things. Uh, so uh, I think that's how we were talking earlier about how children learn. They they mm -hmm. they have some intentionality about things, but they also learn a lot of other things, you know, that they pick up. And so um, we sometimes bring that incidental learning to our attention and look at it. And sometimes we don't, uh, but it's always operating for us because it's ingrained, you know, in our in our neural networks. <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As we learn from experience, it gets encoded up there. <laughs> right. Uh, just uh, in your answer, you, you said uh, uh, one sentence is Karen that let's formalize informal learning. So in mm -hmm. other words, in other words, informal learning can be formalized and can have a, an organization that can have formal structures or establishment for informal learning. Yes, they do, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about mentoring, for example. Mentoring mm -hmm. is really a, a good, has always been a vehicle for informal learning and incidental learning. Uh, wow. Because our mentors are people, you know, we incidentally learn from them just by watching them. They're not intending necessarily to send certain messages, but they do because they're leaders and they're our mentors and they're people we admire. And we want to, we learn to do things by watching them. Uh, and and mu much of that is incidental, but we can also learn informally with them. You know, if you have a mentor, you're informally checking in with them to help you figure out how to think about things or to learn about how things get done around here or something of that sort. Um, on the other hand, in mentoring um, programs in a lot of organizations, there's also formal components. So the organization, for example, might say, 
Oh, and while you're mentoring, uh, here's a set of competencies uh, you, and here's some resource material that you can use in order to help people learn, for example, how we project manage around here. Right. Uh, right. So, so I think those things can happen. And so there's some pieces of it. And there are some research studies that have specifically looked only at that part of informal learning that can be more structured and supported uh, because mm -hmm. it's only, you can't, it's very hard to measure as you may uh, have talked with Karen about, measure and assess informal learning because you have to have a baseline if you're gonna measure an outcome. And in informal learning and incidental learning, we don't ever stop and measure our baseline. Right? <laughs> we're not, we're not, uh, that's not how it works. So we don't have a baseline and it's hard to know when we do learn it, uh, what's the difference between where we went in and where we came out. Whereas in the formal side of things, the aspects that are more formalized, you can measure uh, certain things around the relationship and around what people learn in that mentoring relationship, as an example. <laughs> Yep. Yep. Thank you. That's 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 great. Uh, that's a very positive answer. Mm -hmm. And uh, if informal learning can be formalized, uh, how can we? What are the keys to encourage informal learning at workplace to make them consistent? Yeah. Um, well, there are a number of keys. Um, uh, you know, let me just say before I before I it, it's part of the answer, but. Uh, Many, many people, as you know, probably are familiar with Laven Wenger's uh, Communities of Practice Framework. Um, so it was uh, Etienne Wenger in particular, uh, well, and Lave, who worked in this area for a long, long time with Sylvia Scrivener and other people, uh, who noticed that a lot of learning is, you know, there are different ways of understanding learning. And many times we think of learning as what we do individually and what happens in our head and our skill set and things of that sort. But there are views of learning that, that recognize that learning is situated in any, organ, any routine that we do, any practice that we do, any context that we're in. And that part of the learning is dependent on our interaction with what's in the situation. So with right. certain tools, certain routines, I think that's come to a people's awareness more with COVID-19 and with having to work mm -hmm. at home, because all of a sudden things that were, that we interacted with in the workplace, not just people, but things, routines, um, the things in our office or in our normal work events, uh, the practices that we would do, uh, for example, um, if you think about agile technology, um, agile technology has certain practices built into it. And those practices in and of themselves structure how we think about things. Once we get into a practice, we, we unconsciously are ready to do certain things. It sets us up to be open to do right. certain things. So right. when you interrupt those things, um, it's disorienting. Um, and it also right. makes you aware of how much of our learning you know, happens in the situation at hand. So communities of practice are, are of the idea that there are people who learn together naturally and informally um, just by the fact that they do certain things together and they pick up a lot of learning as a result uh, by being socialized through informal and incidental ways, right? So, um, so you asked me the question, was it, how do you formalize them? The, the question that you just asked me um, had to do with um, how can an organization better support and structure informal learning, right? Um, so, so, we, if you think about how that happens in context, the learning that people do can be supported and facilitated in through different ways. First, you can teach people more individually. You can teach them more skills. We don't, we actually don't, there are certain skills we don't have for informal learning that easily. One of them uh, was pointed out by a British gentleman who studied informal learning, Michael Arout. And he pointed out that through our formal learning, we're prepared to do to learn certain kinds of knowledge and do many things. But one thing we're not as easily taught is pattern recognition skills. And cognitive mm -hmm. scientists, you know, have found that when we when we come into a situation, our our brains automatically size up the situation and they recognize patterns from our past. Those patterns are based on what we learned in the past. But of course, mm -hmm. the past might not fit the present, but the brain does the best job it can to, to pull up from the past what worked in the past 
And unless we stop and diagnose in the situation, how is this present situation different from the past? We're likely mm -hmm. to do what we did in the past and we may or may not have, have the results that we need. So diagnostic skills or pattern recognition is something mm -hmm. that could be taught more formally to people in training programs. As it turns out, many of our training programs are set up to exactly the opposite because mm -hmm. uh, they came from uh, with very good theories uh, that said that, for example, that when you, when you teach people uh, in a training program, you should only give them, you shouldn't give them too many e examples or cases because if you do, they'll get confused uh, and they won't be able to apply what they're learning directly and as it was taught in the new situation. And that's true. But that assumes that the, the, the situation they're applying it in has enough similarity to the situation that it was taught in to be able to be effective. With pattern recognition skills, you want to have people learn about contrasts so they can diagnose what makes it work in one situation and what doesn't make it work in another situation. So that people, the skills that people have when they come into their situation, they can be constantly checking to ask how is this or like or different from what it is that I know and what do I need to be able to change to be effective in this situation. So one, one thing the organization can do is to get better at understanding certain skills that we need in good informal learning and build those into training structures uh, so that we can better prepare people to learn more accurately uh, right. informally, because there's a high possibility for error in informal right. learning since we don't get very good feedback. And that's the second thing that we don't do well in organizations. We don't give good feedback. We, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's another researcher uh, by the name of Skuel uh, in Norway who tried to study and how to assess informal learning, how to measure it. And mm -hmm. many people have been after that holy grail. It's very hard to do because of the fact that it, we're not, we don't have a baseline, you know, we never do. Right. So we don't have assessment. So how can you measure a change if you don't know what it was in the first place? So, mm -hmm. um, so, but he, he, in, in, and his work is really worth looking at because he's done many studies in different contexts over many industries. And he said, what is very good for measuring informal learning is a, is a measure of the learning intensity of jobs. Because if you have learning really intensive really jobs, yeah. And if yep. they contain the resources that people need, for example, more jobs are learning intensive. If they, if you need to uh, work in different circumstances and work with different people, because mm -hmm. you're constantly having to pivot and change how you're doing things. And you're getting ideas from many different perspectives along the way. And when that happens, you naturally have curiosity. And unless there's something suppressing that, you have an opportunity to grow and learn in different ways on a regular basis. That's why we job rotation is such a great way of informal learning. If you, if you put people in different kinds of circumstances, they rise to the occasion. If you give them the right people and resources to help them figure things out, they're gonna do a better job of it and they're gonna learn more. So, um, and one of the, he had seven different things that are part of learning intensive jobs. And one of them is called superior feedback. And by mm -hmm. superior feedback, I said, well, does he mean feedback from superiors like supervisors? No, he means the quality of the feedback. And that mm -hmm. quality is in the best quality feedback, he says, is being able to see the consequences of what you do. So the way work is organized uh, we don't always see when we when we do certain things, we don't see the effect it has downstream on the outcomes. And uh, you know, if you can see the effect more easily or understand the links between what you're doing and how that any modification you make may change something down the line, you can do that more intentionally and more accurately. You know, if you can see those connections. Right. But it, it raises the point around uh, learning, informal learning, and how an organization can help. And I know organizations work at this, but we're not very good at giving good feedback. And part of that is a, is a human problem, I think. You know, uh, for example, out of good intentions, we don't want to hurt your feelings. We don't want to really tell you that you're really messing up here. You know, so we go all around merry go round, you know, all around the bush and try to do it this way or that way. And, and then we're surprised that the person's surprised that they lose their job, you know, or that 
something happens that's not good for them. So, um, and that, that was part of what Kieran and I tried to study and understand about action science, because action science says the same thing, that we don't get good feedback. And if, if we get, we have to guess at what we can do differently to make the, make the situation better. But if the feedback's better, if we're clear about what it is that we're missing in a situation, what we don't see, how other people are thinking about it, and we work together, we can come to a better solution as a result of it. So these are micro things, but very important things. I think that we can do better in training and also in how we help managers, supervisors, peers give better feedback to people and how people can receive feedback better. You know, so that I think if we did those things, we, we would, on the micro level, we could do that, that would work better. And then as uh, Karen probably also talked about, and that's why we, we worked so much on the learning culture and the DLO2 right. as part of the learning culture, the culture and the climate are really, has been shown again and again and again, make a huge difference in uh, supporting learning. And so if you have a culture that um, acknowledges and supports um, doing things that will help you learn, you'll do more of it. I remember back when the learning organization idea was just starting, um, there was a, one of my, my colleagues, I haven't talked to him for a long time, his name is Michael O'Brien. He did a lot of work on learning organization. He worked with Pat McClagan uh, in her consulting firm in Minnesota, and that's how I got to know them all. Um, but Michael uh, was telling me that he had at that time worked with a, a very, I won't give the name, but a very, um, very well known at that time uh, tech company. And uh, they wanted to become a learning organization. So they asked him to come and help them, you know, diagnose what was going on and what they should do. And uh, he's, and a question he asked them that absolutely stunned them and tells a lot about why it was so difficult to be a learning organization was uh, what happens when people make mistakes here? Mm -hmm. because many times they lose their job, you know, or their, their judgment is passed on them that makes them hard to promote. Or, you know, in other words, what happens around mistakes, and particularly at that time, is that you shouldn't make them. And how do you not make them? Well, nobody's going to tell you what to do. So you have to kind of play a guessing game, a detective game to figure out what you should do to not make mistakes, right? But these days, by contrast, um, a number, uh, not so long ago, I was at a conference where uh, there was a panel about um, you know, learning and one of the young people from, uh, from Google, I think it was, asked the question, well, of the people in the room, what, what do you do, with, how many people in the room have ever failed? You know, and about two thirds of us sheepishly raised our hand you know, and she, she laughed and she looked at us and she said, at Google, we don't fail, we course correct. <laughs> it's a totally different idea, right? I mean, it's not, it's not, doesn't have the shame and blame of quote unquote, making a mistake. Uh, but it's, it assumes that particularly in this world where we have a lot of complexity and where there mm -hmm. really are many unknowns in a situation that we have to make mistakes and we can't get paralyzed. We have to try things. Of course, we should be best informed by as much as we can, but then we have to try things out and see if they're working. And if they're not working, we have to say, well, that's not working. Let's try something else. So, um, you know, so the culture and the climate, the culture being the larger macro piece in the whole organization, but many cultures exist partly because of the climate that a manager sets. And so we all know that the manager has a lot of influence uh, in setting the climate for people they work in and they need to be role models for learning they need to be able to coach people. They need to be able to support their informal and incidental learning. And they're not really given much help in doing that. You know, you can't blame them. That's not what they're paid for. They're paid to, for improved performance and getting the, the product down. There's a lot of uh, information in your answer. That's, uh, you mentioned a lot of situated learning. So, and also I wanna, uh, informal learning, I just wanna linger on uh, informal learning. Sure. Uh, <laughs> one more little question is, uh, you mentioned also superior feedback. So social learning is also part of the game, right? Yeah. In mm -hmm. the situation learning in the uh, in the uh, Leib and Wen uh, Leib and Wenger Leib yeah. and Wenger uh, community of practice COP network. Yes. So in their concept, uh, social learning is part. Of, it sounds like social learning is part of it. It is very much part of it, and uh, mm -hmm. that is what we've learned about informal learning. You can learn individually. Um, 
informally, you know, so, and I think, for example, in a lot of tech companies, they expect, right. and the people who are hired expect to be able to learn informally on their own uh, about things to keep up their knowledge in areas, right? So it, mm -hmm. we often call that kind of learning self-directed learning because you have a pretty clear intention to keep up in certain areas and you do certain things with your professional association, training activities, et cetera, to education, um, experimentation on your own or whatever to keep that up. But uh, there's also a, a part of it that is, um, is much more informal and that happens just on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Also, you mentioned the word uh, pattern recognition, yes. recognition, and that reminds me, there's a saying that human is an animal of habitat, and mm -hmm. that's kind of uh, fostered, and then you're trained to do so at workplace. If, you're, you're, if your muscles or brains are trained or encoded that way, sometimes you just do, you know, as, you know, daily manure. Yes. And then you just do it. You don't know why, but uh, sometimes some of the uh, unconscious knowledge kicked in and then yeah. you don't know that you know. Yes. So there's this area called tacit knowing. Uh, right. Tacit Donald knowing. Schoen, you know, worked with a lot also. And in fact, it's even more so it's, it, it, it can consist of two things. One is like habits where you know, there's a lot of work around uh, expertise development. And uh, jo Ron Jacobs actually does a lot of work in that area of, of expertise right. development. So in expertise development, the, it's the novice to expert. And as a novice, you need to have everything spelled out. But as an expert, you, you automatically do things and uh, you don't even know that you're doing them. So that stuff mm -hmm. is just kind of on automatic pilot and it's more habitual, et cetera. Uh, so there's definitely that piece to it, yeah. Um, what I found out is uh, among, uh, back to your answers, uh, what you have uh, shared with us is that there's, there's so many ways, there are so many concepts like workplace learning, informal learning, uh, lifelong learning, uh, just in time learning, actual learning, uh, community of practice, and social learning, uh, feedback system, C280 learning, all these, uh, there's no sing one single, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, there's not one single concept that can dominate one organization's capability management and capability development efforts. So well, it's a kind of a always, always a kind of integrated, integrated yeah. synergy. It is integrated, but all of these pieces rest on learning from experience. And we know mm -hmm. a lot more about learning from experience now um, because of neuroscience. Uh, the, the brain is always active in learning from, from the, we are always learning from experience, whether we're conscious of it or not. And the brain is encoding these kinds of things. And right. uh, so um, if, if you, if there are ways and, you know, depending on how you think about learning and how you think it's happening in that situation, meaning is it mostly happening inside of your brain, in which case things like reflection and there are certain things that you can do to improve that learning. But if it's happening more without that conscious kind of things than other things might be, for example, if it's happened in a situated way because of the mm -hmm. practices that you're involved in and you want to get people to look at those practices differently, then you can change the practices. You can do mm -hmm. things to tweak the practices or you can have an after action review where you look at all of the steps in a certain implementation of by a practice and see what results you're getting and then consciously say, okay, we have to be aware. I'll give you an mm -hmm. example of this. Um, in, uh, in intensive care units, there was a study of intensive care units in, um, in, in the medical area in Germany. And, mm -hmm. and in intensive care units, you have to be constantly interrupting your, your habits because every individual is very different. And when systems fail, human systems fail, or when our, our difficulty in, in surviving, uh, your system and my system are going to operate differently. And so people who, medical people in intensive care, they have to know what they know, but then they have to interrupt it all the time because the mm -hmm. solution for you or the solution for me might not be something that works for other people. And so they have an environment. And they, this was a study of how in certain kinds of areas, the, the practice is to interrupt the practice. Whereas, mm -hmm. uh, whereas it, to make things move more smoothly in a, in, where things operate in ways where the practice should be the practice, we have people conform to the practice because we know that if they do it that way, we're gonna get optimal results. Even if they'd rather try something else, we want them to do it that way. 
but there are many situations where the practice is to interrupt the practice because if we mm-hmm. do it the way we did it before, we're not going to get the results that we want. So how right. do you create those conditions for that kind of innovation? And uh, those conditions might be different uh, and people have to manage to different circumstances. So like the idea of creative abrasion that some people have written about in innovation areas where in fact, if we have a team of five people, we're all hired in order because we have different points of view and we're gonna bump up against one another. But you as a manager have to know how to manage the bumping up to make it productive and not dysfunctional. <laughs> so, right, right, right. <laughs> Yeah. Resolve the contentions and make it more uh, con- con- constructive in- yes. instead of this. Yeah. Yeah, you bet. Thank you. That's uh, that's a uh, that's really kind of hit the bottom of what in, uh, in- informal learning is and uh, how do mm-hmm. we encourage and how do we build how we formalize in the, at workplace and uh, yes. create value for the organizations and what are the back end uh, theories and yes. uh, theoretical um, uh, foundations are. So. Yeah. I think what's interesting now, and this is why Karen and Karen and I have also in different ways moved to, um, if you look at what happens at the group level or at a, a collective level, you have to look at different things than if you look at the individual level. So many of the things that we early worked on around individual, around informal learning had to do with what I as an individual can do when I learn informally myself or in collaboration with other people. And the collaboration with other people happens a lot. Uh, so if you take something like agile technology, for example, and you want to understand it, you might not look at the individual level of learning, even though individuals might need to learn a one or other thing to participate in a better in a better way. You would look at what are the what are the ways in which um, the collective learning well, works well, at, at mm. how what are those points at which informal learning has happened at at the group level. And what should that look like and where and how can we improve that? Uh, so, you know, so, and I think in communities of practice, uh, right. to some extent, that's what Lave and Wenger were looking at is how can we look at the community? Uh, and, and I think, you know, H- HRD usually looks at the community as a whole. And so we set out to um, figure out the best way to provide this kind of thing. Um, one, one piece of it, I think, uh, that we some, I don't know if we could do this better, but it strikes me that as I've looked at a lot of research on this informal learning, one piece of research has to do with learning paths. So mm-hmm. each of us has preferences around how we learn and we, we in, it's like personal learning networks, right? These are things that we have that we don't think about, but if you sit mm-hmm. down and think about your personal learning network, you might construct a more effective one. The same is true for our learning paths. We have certain preferences that we uh, follow and part of it is dictated by our own preferences and part by what we have access to, et cetera. But if we understood more about people's learning paths, we, mm-hmm. we might be able to A, uh, really figure out more rationally which resources are uh, in which learning right. strategies should we make available right. because these are like engineers have certain preferences. And if you try to teach them in another way, you're not gonna reach them initially. So certain things, you know, you wanna play to their strengths. But you can also see that some things may be uh, block, blocking. They may have blocks that they, even though they don't like to go someplace else, you need them to go there in order to be able to be most valuable to themselves and to the organization. And so you can also, system, uh, you know, selectively create opportunities for them to stretch and grow in areas that they need to stretch and grow in. You know, for example, for managers, they may not naturally be, give good feedback, but if you know that's really central to really making things work, then you need to find strategies to, to help them grow in that area. And so if we, rather than just kind of have a scattershot approach and putting everything out there, if we could better understand the learning paths that people have, So we can say these are the typical ones in our people, or maybe they're different for, they probably are for IT people versus marketing people or versus, you know, shop floor people, et cetera. Uh, So you can kind of get a sense of what is their pattern and you can really uh, make better use of resources and probably help them learn better informally. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Next question is about, is around uh, action learning. Mm -hmm. Uh, Action learning, well, 
Um, this question is a uh, is a very deep question, I would say. It is because uh, it's been very popular in China mm -hmm. uh, for the past like five to ten years, mm -hmm. and uh, there's ups and downs. So there are successes and there are failures. Mm -hmm. So tell us what's your definition of uh, action learning and uh, what does it do? What pro or what problem does it solve? Yeah. So. Um as you know, I mean, as you said, there are many different ways of practicing action learning. Um, and uh, my, uh, my colleague and I have, uh, Judy O'Neill, with whom I've done a lot of work in the action learning space, uh, her dissertation, she wanted to understand uh, how people facilitate or how they support action learning. You know, Reg Revens, who is considered often the father of action learning, um, he, he did not believe in facilitators. He felt that if you had people in, who were learning coaches or facilitators, that what they would do is steal the learning from people. Because at the heart of action learning, it's the idea that people really have the capacity to learn themselves from their experience um, and that they can do that naturally if we kind of get out of their way and let them direct their own learning. But there are flaws with that idea um, because, uh, not everybody has equal capacity to direct their own learning. And we right. also know that um, people have different levels of uh, ability to think complexly and systematically. And so they, some people need more direction. They need more, they might need it generally. So there are people who just generally need more direction. They, they don't like, to, they're very uncomfortable in mm -hmm. being asked to do this on their own. They want to be guided, you know, through it. So and they may always want that. So there's some people who always like to learn that way. There are other people who might want to be guided in some areas because it's new to them and they need to understand the map of the territory. But once they understand the map, they're quite fine going off on their own hikes, you know? <laughs> so, you know, there, there are differences in that kind of thing. So um, I think uh, in action learning, um, there is a, the, the common and core idea is that uh, people, uh, when we learn in certain situations, we can set up the learning around that so that it's more effective and that we learn better and we learn in ways that we take new perspectives on the situation. So you ask, when does it work and when does it, does it not? The original people in England who were working with this had come up with, and that is that uh, action learning works best, kind of like where design thinking works, be works best. It works best mm -hmm. in situations where there are maybe multiple answers to a situation. None of them are perfect. There are a lot of stakeholders. It's, it's a area around which the solutions people would disagree over. And the best way of getting at that is to open up new thinking around it, which I think is what design thinking uh, does also, uh, but in a, you know, more for innovation purposes there. But Action learning in some ways originally was designed for where we don't have solutions to situations. So if you are uh, in a situation where there's a lot of best practices that are known, you don't wanna do action learning. You wanna do application learning. You know, you want people to practice with feedback, but you know that there are certain things you want them to do because everybody has worked this out. We don't have to rediscover the wheel. In this situation, this is what you do. And so teaching people routines and practices they can rely upon in that case doesn't call for action learning. Um, and then at the opposite end of the spectrum, you know, uh, there are situations which are really at the cutting edge and where we know that we don't know. And that, at, that in those areas, action learning is very good. And then there's ranges in between, depending on what is not known. So, you know, you might have done something before in an area, but you haven't done it in this industry or in that setting or in that value chain, et cetera, or in another culture, for example. Just because something I do in the United States works, it doesn't mean I can go to China and do the same thing and expect it to work the same way because there's different cultural conditions and different ways of thinking and working. And so it requires an adaptation and it's not clear exactly what the adaptation should be. And so uh, action learning puts smart people together who are not experts in the situation, but who are willing to talk with experts and gather information and then think together about experimenting with different possible alternatives that might open up thinking about a different way of doing things. So, uh, so that, that really is how action learning was designed. And 
uh, Judy found that uh, there are uh, in her dissertation that based on the, the person who's designing it, who knows the situation, we're back to that question of how do situations vary, right? So that the same brand of action learning might not work well for you in one situation, but it will work well in another situation. So as a, as a person who designs it, you have to think about how much freedom do people need in this situation or want? You know, do I, uh, do I, how much intervention do I need? And do I have a lot of smart people who I can just put in a room with a very interesting problem and let them go at it and they will come out with something and I can trust that because they know how to work themselves through it. And if they need help, they'll call for it. You know, is it that kind of situation? Or is it a situation where I'm going to have to scaffold it more along the way and where I have to add in certain kinds of activities to support learning new things along the way? And so the skill, I think, in designing and supporting action learning is to be able to understand you know, where, where the learners are and to support them as they get more able to um, take on their own learning. I mean, some people are really able to do that and other people need help. And the team as a whole might need help. So that's why I think we have such different looking action learning programs. Right. And I think it fails when we try to impose um, an outside perspective. You know, mo most learning from experience works best if we help people, if we are, we're stay close to the learners and find out where they're at, because we do know that people cannot um, take in new information unless they can relate it to what they already know. So there are the cognitive structures that we have are dependent on how we formed viewpoints over time. And if I come in and give, uh, ask you to do certain things, you have to fit that in your understanding of things in order to be able to act on it. And so staying close to the learner means understanding how people understand things. And they need to help decide what their own next step is, but you need to be able to help them figure out what that is. And so in action learning, you want people to be mostly in charge of their own learning. But if you're right. a facilitator or a learning coach, you're helping them to figure out when they get stuck to see new, see what, where they're stuck, to see what that right. is and to help think right. their way through to other alternatives to try to get to the next step. Can action learning be nicknamed uh, PBL problem-based learning in that well, way? Well, problem-based learning is on the spectrum. You know, so there's a series of right. things that are action oriented and problem oriented, right? Or situation oriented, if you don't want to call it a problem. Positive psychology mm -hmm. people don't like to call things problems. <laughs> they like right. to call them opportunities or challenges, but they're right. still working around some situation, right? <laughs> right. But problem based learning is, um, I would say, is where, you know, do you know the Kunavin framework for complexity where that was done by, um, by this guy in IBM a number of years ago, it, it says that we have certain kinds of known knowns and we have certain kinds of known unknowns and certain unknown, unknown unknowns. And so unknown. for known yeah. knowns, uh, you know, you can kind of know what the situation is, but um, as, as you move into unknowns, some unknowns, there are answers out there, but um, you have to interview the right people or look at it from the right perspective. And you can offer from an action learning point of view by talking to people, you can mm -hmm. offer up other way, informed ways of thinking about the situation mm -hmm. that if I take them on and try them, maybe I, that won't work itself, but it'll open up some other avenue of thinking, et cetera. And then there mm -hmm. are these unknown unknowns where I have right. to really sense and respond or stabilize the situation before I can move, move further into it. And so I think, you know, a different kind of action learning uh, might need to work um, in, in those different situations. So uh, business management leaders or, or management leader use action learning to solve their management or operational problems mm -hmm. in workplace, mm -hmm. at workplace? Uh, they do, um, you know, to just finish the problem-based learning. What problem-based learning does is it works for the, for the known unknowns, if you would, because we can incorporate enough uh, similarity to real situations that people get to practice it and they try out different solutions. So, right. you know, it does work for that, but when you get more into the unknowns, it doesn't work so much. So I guess managers, when they use it, um, are really facing unknowns, right? I mean, they wouldn't necessarily use it otherwise. So I think it can work, um, you know, for 
managers facing unknowns. Um, and um, the, the question uh, is how to really support it. If, if the manager, him or herself, tries to facilitate an action learning piece, one of the challenges is that the hierarchy gets in the way. Because we all right. know that when you have hierarchy, even if you encourage people to speak out, it's very hard for people oh, to speak out, right? Impossible. It's just hard. Most of the time. So right. you, you really have to work action learning where people can be peers, you know, enough to be able to, sh to speak out and say things to one another. And you have to help them sometimes. We use action science skills in action learning programs to help people figure out how to speak out because they may not have the skill. Uh, they may speak out with good intentions, but not frame it in such a way that people can hear it. And so uh, one of the things that you can, you know, a lot of soft skills you can learn through action learning because it gets down to in the situation, how do you communicate? How do you offer uh, feedback in a way that it can be heard? Uh, you know, mm. interpersonal skills, these, these all come up um, in an action learning program. Some of the most powerful learning for people isn't necessarily the big challenge they're working on, but it's more developing their leadership skills in the group, becoming a better peer coach, um, helping group dynamics. Uh, you know, it's day-to-day -day stuff, but it's not stuff we've ever learned very well. And usually in groups, it can be pretty high stakes for us if we do it wrong. And so groups don't always work well. So action learning can be very helpful in terms of, um, you know, helping people get past some of those dynamics and for managers facing unknown challenges going into new markets or um, you know facing these days uh, with artificial intelligence and challenges around upskilling and reskilling we might know the skills uh, that we can teach and we might know how to teach them but we might not know how to find the right people and we might not you know they may have some differences that we need to add things to what we do in order to be able to help them to really uh, hear what we're talking about and support them differently. So, so there are always unknown aspects of the situation right. that we're in. I have always been uh, perplexed by why action learning uh, many times it is, uh, it should be a learning method or delivery method, uh, a way of learning instead of a, a exploratory tool to solve management uh, operational problems because mm -hmm. Those are very complex problems. Oh yes, it involves all aspects of our, of a company, yeah. of an enterprise, and mm -hmm. that's so complicated. Mm -hmm. So if we try to use action learning sessions to solve complicated problems, and a lot of times are unknown, and that's very mm -hmm. dangerous because because it's not. I mean, especially in the developing countries, large as China, mm -hmm. the matter is not to. Uh, is is not nice to have something that they, they need to it, it's a it's a matter of survival it's yeah. a matter of life and death mm -hmm. it's, it's not like i'm fortune 500 i can have the reserve a huge reserve to go on especially under the covid situation i can go on for another year without growth yeah. but in china the competition is very fierce and the uh, market is very keen and the growth need if you don't grow meaning that's the end if you don't grow. So that's the characteristic of. So like that's I, among your answers, uh, based on your answers, I think I figure out why action learning most of the times um, they are very popular in China. It was because it's actually the word action is contrary uh, or is kind of follow the modern trend trend of since web 2.0, you know, everybody has their own cell phone, every had, everybody yeah. is, uh, has an information center. Yeah. They want to put into action instead of in the old time, doc feeding, you know, teaching session, you know, uh, yes. the good old, the ILT, yes. instructor led yes. training, like from thousand years of, from the, the, the ages of, of, of Confucius, you know? Yes. So, so now action learning is the members or students participate. Mm -hmm. And especially you have been the East, East uh, part of the world and uh, especially in East China, I mean, in uh, East Asia, the culture mm -hmm. is to follow. Yes. To follow the instructions and uh, follow the leaders and follow. So, so it's not very active, but with technology and action learning is kind of a wake up call or mm -hmm. it's kind of a eye opener. So that's why it's been very popular in China. But it's not a, you know, cure all. It's, <laughs> you it's not a cure all. 
It's not a no. cure-all. And in, in very situations like you describe, you may have to do some action learning, whether you like it or not, but you want to be able to do the things that you can do. It's more like a right. complicated situation with some elements of complexity. So in complicated situations, you want to you always want to use what you know, right? I mean, there's right. no sense in ignoring what we know. So if we can take a situation and say, so what do we know about and what can we right. address by doing that? And for that, we can, right. we can get experts to help us. We can, we can change practices so they're, they work better. Um, I think practices structure a lot of learning. And so if we alter the practice, we can build in more knowledge intensive, what we know in, into the practice right. and it, it works better. Right. So there, I think you want to, most action learning programs that I know of don't only do the innovative discovery learning, but they also do uh, because they're, their leadership development or their development programs. Oh, yeah, they also course. include a lot of information giving and they include, uh, if, if it's about strategy, you need to understand how to do strategy better. You need to know what people know. And then you say, there's still this area that we don't know. I, I was just reading a, yeah. articles in the paper uh, yesterday in our paper, because a lot of our small business owners are in similar situation you know, as yours in China right, right now, uh, because they're not, they're not going to be able to survive the pandemic if they if they right. don't. So they pushed people into very experimental modes where they're essentially doing action learning on trying things that they hadn't thought before uh, in order to see whether that will work. But they, you know, in action learning, just as in a number of other kinds of situations, like, for example, fail fast, right? It doesn't mean that you shouldn't do everything you can to succeed. And it doesn't mean failing fast, right? And it doesn't mean that you're going to embark on something that you can't try out in a certain way. So you do, you run experiments, right? You try things out, you see what works, you see what doesn't. So uh, even in the process, it brings your knowledge in. So maybe we don't know what the outcome is, but we know that this process is likely to get us closer to it than that process. So mm -hmm. you're, yeah. it's true. Yeah. I mean, action learning was never meant to be a, a substitute for any kind of other learning. Right. Yeah. Right. Maybe we can right. call it active learning versus action learning, right? Exactly, <laughs> active, exactly. Active I like the word active, better. Active learning is very good. And um, yes, but action learning as was designed is, is you know, not, not for all situations. You shouldn't you shouldn't use it when there are better ways of helping people, you know, get to know things. Right. Sometimes we were entangled or indulged ourselves into some of the terms because of concepts and then because it's easier for mar for marketing, you know what right. I mean? So, I know. Yeah. So that's for the business purposes, it's not for the, so uh, uh, back to the uh, action learning definition of what it should be. Mm -hmm. I think a uh, matter of fail or success in action learning or active learning is the key word I think is controlled. So if we can, con can control what the session, control session, if it is control session, meaning we know what we know, uh, we know what we don't know, and then still you know, control. So use what we know to explore what we don't. And that's, you know, that, that's a known, unknown part, uh, a pattern right. of, yeah. Right. So that's I mean, more controlled than then. You don't, you don't have to fail <laughs> on right. that session anymore. Yeah, I, I think what uh, action learning does that some other forms of learning, not learning, but training or, you know, learning, designed learning don't do is that uh, it does maximize hearing from people who are directly in the line of work uh, in different aspects of it, who otherwise wouldn't be heard. So, right. um, th and that part is very important because sometimes people, uh, we were talking about tacit knowing, right? So there are right. people who know a lot of very important things, but never tell you that, partly because mm -hmm. they don't know it themselves. I mean, they, they've never put it into words and they think you know what they right. know. And, <laughs> and they do, you know, and maybe you don't invite it. You know, in action science, right. we know that we often don't invite the other person to tell us what they're thinking. And so they don't right. say it, right? So um, in action learning, this idea of peer learning, you know, of being able to set up conditions because if you and I are working in the same industry or the same business, each of us in somewhat different situations, you're going to ask me much better questions than the professor in the university will, because yeah. you, uh, you're, you're, we are all shaped by the situation. And so there are questions you know of because of the context 
that you're going to ask that that somebody outside of the context cannot. And so action learning definitely focuses on uh, being able to create situations where everybody's point of view can be put out there and expressed and where we mm -hmm. can hear it and listen to it and take it into consideration. Because sometimes mm -hmm. the solution to challenges comes from unexpected places and we have to be mm -hmm. open to that idea. So this idea mm -hmm. of perspective taking, taking different perspectives is a very important part of action learning um, that you might not get with, um, you don't really get it all the time in areas where we know what to do because if you know what to do and it works, you're not gonna try something else, right? <laughs> But if you're not sure, then you want to invite a lot more, even things that sound a little nuts and crazy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it may have a kernel of truth that we need to understand. Um, mm -hmm. and we don't want to ignore. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's that's back to uh, workplace learning. Mm -hmm. So uh, so to me, workplace learning is kind of an umbrella and all lifelong learning, uh, action learning and informal yeah. learning everything else and kind mm -hmm. of uh, kind of like uh, and fall underneath it and is, is that true well workplace learning is an umbrella for everything for the workplace right um right I think lifelong learning is sometimes also outside of the the workplace because lifelong right. learning takes into consideration uh raising your child uh you know taking care of your grandparents you know it, it includes anything in life and all and these days almost everything we do calls for new learning because there's new ways of doing everything, new technology to assist us, fewer options in some cases, too many options in another, you know, so we're constantly having to learn, right? Uh, there's a guy um, in um, England, um, Jackson, Norman, Norman Jackson, who writes about learning ecologies, who talks about learning that is life-wide, lifelong, and life-deep. Uh, lifelong? Can, li can you li Life-wide, lifelong, mm -hmm. and life-deep. So, yes. uh, and he encourages us to bring that learning into the workplace. So when we bring it into the workplace, you know, for example, you have life deep learning about raising a child. And some of that can transfer into the workplace in other situations. So mm -hmm. if, if we prevented you from taking anything you knew outside of work and you couldn't use it in the workplace, um, we would be losing a lot of good opportunities. So life if you're taking advantage of learning that's lifelong, life-wide and life deep, you want mm -hmm. employees to be learning all the time and you want them to um, not, there's always a line between home and work, you know, that you don't, oh, yeah. don't necessarily want to cross, but that doesn't mean that some of what you learn at work, you can't use at home and some of what you learn at home, you can't use at work. And so, um, you know, I think the demarcation is that uh, at work in workplace learning, Everything is seen through the uh, through the lens of uh, of the work and the contract that people have about being productive in that workplace, right? So anything that is governed uh, that needs to be done, which would include interpersonal relations, collaboration, um, emotional intelligence, social intelligence, you know, these are things that we might also need to have at home. And um, some of the things people learn, for example, in action learning programs, when we talk about what they've learned, they've applied in their home lives, like with their child, with their teenage child or in, the, in their relationship with their spouse. And it's very right. valuable. But in mm -hmm. the workplace, it's also valuable. And in the workplace, that learning is all channeled to uh, helping to helping that workplace succeed more in one way or another. Mm -hmm. So, um, but it does include, um, it, it, it can include all forms of formal, informal, and um, uh, I would say non-formal, you know, learning, uh, incidental learning, it, things that are, that are brought into the workplace and used for us to get, uh, by us, to get, get work done better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. Karen, Karen may have talked with you a little bit about this article that she and I and another colleague uh, have been writing uh, it's it's really looking at the relationship between work and learning and, you know, mm -hmm. because that sort of changed over time, but it was spurred by uh, one of my uh, colleagues, uh, Rachel Fichter, had observed that, um, you know, we used to talk about work-based learning. So Joe Raylan, for example, talks about work-based learning where we learn through our work and 
we take what we do at work and we make it the subject of our learning because we have to apply it immediately. So we want to reduce the distance between the classroom, so to speak, and the, and the application area. And so if you start with the application, you have work-based learning. Um, mm -hmm. But she said, we also have learning-based work because, we, because of all the things that we need to learn, there are also places where we, we, we concede that we have to stop and get more information. We have to learn more things before we can apply them in new ways. And so, um, you know, uh, I think um, there is also this term out there. I think it was Carl Weick, I think, who used it, the, the difference between exploration and exploitation. So we do both mm -hmm. kinds of learning, right? So we exploit what we know in good ways. We, we use it. But we also have to explore new things in order to exploit what we know. <laughs> mm -hmm. So there's an interaction between those two kinds of learning. Right. Um, thank you so much. This is a, this is a very, very, very uh, profound uh, sharing session of knowledge. I mean, there's a lot of uh, uh, knowledges and there's so many key figures. I have all my <laughs> notebook is all <laughs> put it down, all these key points. Uh, <laughs> Whole, whole, whole two, um, the full two pages. <laughs> and the whole key, there's a lot of a digest and uh, to connect. But what, I, what I've learned so far is that the uh, workplace is a workplace is a complicated environment or situation. Yeah. There's mm -hmm. so many concepts and theories and standards mm -hmm. and processes and models and mm -hmm. you know, guidelines can be applied mm -hmm. to one workplace learning system mm -hmm. or learning structure. So yes. to the, the simple word out to the uh, audience, to our audience in front of cameras, you, uh, we have seen that what Dr. Marsik has shared with us, there's so many profound knowledges and mean, I mean theories. They're all on the back end. They're not on a daily basis, but they are the mothership for our daily works. I mean, every project, every small program that we are initiating uh, or working or buying for our organization and carrying out for our uh, for our uh, target audiences are all kind of in line here and there in alignment with all these theories because these are the forces unseen or invisible or tacit forces that determines the mm -hmm. effectiveness of our work. So that's that's what I've learned and uh, it is so crucial. So just to um, um, I want to ask you a little bit about um, about the pandemic. A little bit we mentioned yeah. here and there. So, how do you yeah. think a pandemic or particular will impact our field? Yeah, I think it's impacting our field a lot. Um, I, it's right. impacting everything, right? But um, there is this. I there's these ideas, you know, um, that I read about through various think tanks like the Great Reset, you know, that um, the World yeah. Economic Forum is, uh, is addressing and uh, other bodies that essentially are getting after the same idea. So um, what, you know, in some ways uh, we benefit from the disruption of the pandemic as a society. Right. I mean, we may not feel like we're benefiting from it now, but in the grand scheme of things, it offers an opportunity to, uh, stop and look at what we've been doing and ask ourselves if, if, if that's what should continue or how we should do things differently going forward. Um, because, mm -hmm. you know, usually it's very difficult to change because there's a, there's a leg legacy system in place and the legacy system resists change uh, with some good reasons, you know, et cetera. But many yeah. of our legacy systems have been torn down by the pandemic. Uh, they've been shown that they don't work so well anymore. And so I think we, we have the opportunity, uh, you know, to, to think smart and to, it, it's a bit like what we were just talking about, that there are some things that are known and there's a lot of things that are unknown, but we right. can use what we know more intelligently to help set up things as we move forward. And, uh, and these are, some of these things are things that were going to happen anyway, right? So um, the, the, the way technology has infused, intelligent technology has infused our lives that's not going to go away and we're going to rely on it more and more. And um, human beings need to partner with technology you know, effectively. Uh, we, there are going to be many new, um, there are going to have to be new ways, of, not only new ways of working at old jobs, but new work 
coming out of this whole thing. And so I, I think that maybe one, one lesson of the pandemic is for us to really kind of get sufficiently, um, you know, Kurt Lewin talks about, you have to have to un, you have to have disruption, you have to have change or disruption, then you can have learning and you can have new growth, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So change and then relearn learning and then new, you know, solidifying it. But this is kind of a constantly moving cycle in a way. But I, but I think we're at that place. So what is it that learning and development people, uh, human resource development people, can learn from uh, from this from this pandemic in terms of how what kinds of um, workforces we need and, and how we can best support um, people at work in order to be able to move forward. Um, I, I think there are a lot of unknowns out there. I mean, I know there are a lot of unknowns out there, but that's where I think people are putting their minds to. I'm, right. I feel like it's a, it, because maybe I'm a, a student of a bit of history in my undergraduate work, uh, history and social sciences were of interest along with English and literature. Um, mm -hmm. I think when we're in the middle of our history, it's always hard to necessarily step back and see uh, the big patterns. But I, I think that's what we're being asked to do. So we, we maybe need uh, to gather the leaders in human resource development in our different countries, um, you know, to think together about um, what, what do we want it to look like, right? What do we see our organizations being and how do we see the knowledge that we have so far applying, what are things that are out there that we haven't yet applied? And can we begin to think about new systems um, to put in place? Um, it's, it's going to be very interesting. Yeah, yeah. What I'm thinking uh, is that you reminded me that not only, I mean, the Great Reset is, is so important uh, to realize that everything is changing, uh, including our industry, uh, the learning yes. development industry as a whole and our field as a whole. Yes. I, th I think that, yeah, it is very absolutely necessary for the top thinkers to get together to figure out what's going to be in the next 20, 30, or even half a century. Yes. What's going to happen? What are the learning or development roles are going to be for organizations? Because the society will change and mm -hmm. also the way that people uh, intake information, process it and retrieve and apply those information are different because the environment will be different and businesses and they will have new ways to survive, to thrive. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, people interact with each other differently right now. Mm -hmm. For instance, right now, there are a lot of job positions that are permanently remote, yeah. you know, make it right. remote mm -hmm. already. Mm -hmm. Teddy, uh, about 20 years ago, a friend of my management uh, in, at Capella University, her name is Nancy Johnson. She wrote a book on tele telecommuting. I thought mm -hmm. uh, at that time I was working for U.S. West. Uh -huh. And I thought, well, that's what I do right now because uh, I commute, you know, I tell you, I work from home, you uh -huh. know, two days a week and or mm -hmm. even three days a week. And that's encouraged by, by uh -huh. our company. Yes. And that we're, we were the forerunners and front mm -hmm. runners in that concept. But now it's kind of, a, you know, for many businesses, if you can, you have to work remotely unless those are manufacturing jobs, you know, so mm -hmm. on and so forth. Yes. So the way, I mean, the society is changing at a, such a rapid speed. And you just also mentioned that we need, there's so many to learn. And I, I think they're also a thinking that there is a lot to unlearn in order to learn. <laughs> yes, there is a lot to unlearn in order to learn. That's you're, yeah. you're very right to put your finger on that. The unlearning is not easy and we, we do need to unlearn. Right, right, right. The pattern recognition, it loops back, loops back to the pattern recognition, yeah. how our mm -hmm. brain works and how the environment, what, what the situation, the learning, uh, le learning and what the social learning and how do we get feedback, superior feedback, mm -hmm. it, it, loops, it loops back. What, mm -hmm. I'm, what I'm seeing is there is always kind of a loop or structural structure mm -hmm. there, solid mm -hmm. structure, but a lot of times they're visible or half visible, uh, a lot of them are invisible to many mm -hmm. uh, uh, professionals, but they are, they are the superior force that uh, determine, drives our learning uh, talent development efforts for mm -hmm. organizations. Yeah. So thank you for the advice and uh, 
So uh, uh, second to the last question, mm -hmm. uh, if you had a chance to start all over again, <laughs> what would have you done or chosen differently? <laughs> I, I thought know. a lot about I that know. question. I didn't think a lot about what I could answer. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, one thing I would have done was learn more languages. You know, we in the United States are very uh, inhibited, I think, and hobbled in a way by not knowing more languages. So, uh, you know, I think right. all of us should. Communication is the lifeblood, right, of of right. Uh, of the world, and uh, none of us should be hobbled by one language. We, we should all have more facility at being mm. able to communicate, uh, you know, differently in the world. So, um, right. yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure of, if I would have done uh, things differently. You know, we all, um, to some extent, our lives are shaped by planning and to some extent by serendipity, you know, by what, right. what opportunities emerge, et cetera. And yeah. uh, so uh, I can't think of There's an opportunity. I can't think of an opportunity that I wish I would have taken. Mm -hmm. I, I can think of opportunities that I've thought about at the time, should I take this opportunity? Mm -hmm. And I made the yeah. decision I made because I felt it was the right decision. It's hard to know what would have happened had a, had a, you know, had I, I taken that opportunity rather than the one that I did. So um, I don't think I have a good answer to that question. <laughs> I know, I know. Every time I ask this question, uh, every guest, uh, their uh, their answers are really different. Very, really very, <laughs> really very. And uh, some of them say I don't do, I, uh, but uh, some of them say, uh, uh, you know, like languages, like uh, you know, their management skills and like marketing, like this yeah. and like that. Mm -hmm. So, or or even written more books and something like that. So it's a it's a very hard question. And I never asked myself this question. If somebody else asked me about this question, oh, I will say, okay, sit, just sit back. I give me half day <laughs> for my half time for 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 my half life. Yes, <laughs> <Retrospect>. <laughs> Anyway, uh, as a closing statement, uh, what uh, do you have any uh, advice to young practitioners in China and development countries as a whole? Well, I, I think, you know, the important thing is to be keep open and keep trying new things, right? Um, right. I think um, young people, partly guided by older people, you know, mistakenly, perhaps, um, you know, that the get pushed into things that uh, they may or may not be interested in doing. And they close out opportunities. I mean, we all do that, right? So you can't do everything. But I think, uh, being more open, I think we all as a, as societies need to be open to other people's views and mm -hmm. be able to really, um, you know, develop our own skills and think in, you know, I would call it critical thinking. I don't think it, I don't, that means so many different things to anybody, but in good thinking, right, where we are able to sort through things and where uh, we take in evidence, but not only just the rational evidence, not just the facts, the facts are very important, obviously, but to take in also the subliminal messages and the, the interpersonal messages, you know, so developing our um, ability to stay tuned to what's out there and to, to take in widely what's out there and keep open to um, considering a lot of different perspectives, you know, being, being available to that. I think that's what I would suggest. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a really, really um, good educational session. Thank you for the interview. <laughs> Thank you for sharing so many valuable information with, with, <laughs> with, with us. Actually, there, there, there are so many things that I've learned. And I guess I'm sure that our audiences will, will learn as well. And uh, so thank you so much. Well, thank and, you for uh, the opportunity, and you're a very, you're a very good interviewer, George. <laughs> oh. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. That's that's uh, driven by the curiosity. <laughs> and, and by the way, you know, there's a curious George. I I, I learned that there in the. There is a American curious Party. George. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 That's me. And I actually, I I, I was born. I am a monkey. Uh, I mean, I was 
born the year of monkey to you were born the year of the monkey that's great yes <laughs> and he's a zodiac 68 so that's wonderful uh, yes yes and uh, it's so kind of a uh, it all meant to be you know and so uh when when you when you, when you see kids and uh you know uh, when we talk about all about this and at the very beginning and then we see mm -hmm. the, the younger generations i mean you put everything we do into a meaning you know mm -hmm. Yes. And then see them thrive and see them learning and see them log online and see, uh, watch our conversations. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they ask me questions on social groups like WeChat. Mm -hmm. And then I'm, I'm really, I mean, I mean, I'm really grateful that uh, I've got so many uh, master thinkers in this field, like, mm -hmm. uh, like including you, you yourself and, uh, so this program will run till next year, next May, mm -hmm. and uh, it totally 52 sessions, but we have 250 uh, master thinkers in this field. Mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. first one is was an online conference, but the last one will be a memorial session, special oh. edition. Ah, all the, uh, like, yeah, all the people that passed away left us yeah. during the past, I don't say 20 or 30 years, but yeah. really cast important influences like, mm -hmm. you know, like, uh, uh, B.F. Skinner and, yes. uh, you know, you know, so Chris many Archer. big figures. Chris Archer. Oh, Chris Archer. And Donald and, uh, Trump, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. And also, uh, uh, recently, just recently, uh, Roger Kaufman and, of course, mm -hmm. uh, the late Ghanai and mm -hmm. all of those big, great names. Yes. So it'll be a, be, a, uh, be a special session. It won't be long, but that's, you know, that's, they deserve it. And uh, they deserve, deserve all of respect. Thank, so you we're always Thank you for doing that. I think that's yes. really important for us to remember uh, these people. You know, we're, we're, we're standing, we are standing on the shoulders of giants. And there you go. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much. Please take care and stay tuned and stay, uh, stay. In. Well, I'll use uh, the good old uh, Garrison Killer say, well, do good work, <laughs> be well, and stay right. in touch. We'll do that. Absolutely. It's been quite a pleasure, George. Thank you very much for Thank the opportunity. Me yeah. Okay. Me too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>
um, learning and development figure in the international on the international stage. He is a keynote speaker. He is a presenter. He is a workshop facilitator. He presents. He hosts, and he speaks. He's uh, very active on Facebook, on tu on Twitter, in on many many social medias. And in the summer of 2020, he and uh, his colleagues conducted an online learning six week long, long online learning conference learning development conference and after that because of the, all the good words and and uh, and uh, because it went uh, such a big hit globally so no one wanted them to stop so they started the LDA the learning development uh, accelerator so and uh, and uh, Dr. Will, Ta Will Talheimer has been very active in this field, and uh, so during our next week's interview, we are going to ask him a lot of questions around learning solutions, uh, around uh, training needs analysis, which is very current task for many learning and development uh, professionals, and also what are the biggest obstacles in learning functions to help organization realize their goals about his smiley sheets, performance focused smiley sheets, uh, and what is a smile sheet. And also about, of course, about the learning and development accelerator. So we're gonna have a lot of question, questions waiting for him. So until next week, please stay safe, stay tuned. Thank you everybody and good night.